We had no place else to go. We were looking to do a, a concert for live footage for the film. And uh, no matter what we tried, it just seemed like uh, because they were the Beatles, they just couldn't do a show someplace. So we really had to isolate ourselves that day and just just do a show with, without any interruption. Uh, it, pretty soon, you can see people are coming off of roofs. They're in windows. They're on ledges. This old gentleman is even going to see what it's about. <laughs> I don't think any of us realize that this is a historic day, uh, which is being with the Beatles in general. I don't think any of us realize that the Beatles were going to be the Beatles. Uh, I had made comments before to Ringo that I couldn't wait for the whole thing to get over with. So, because I, I really wanted to later on in life, just for him and I to hang out and just be pals, uh, but they're still the Beatles. I mean, that's, that's never changed. Uh, this is uh, the first time I worked with the Beatles. Uh, the very first day I worked with them, I was 27 years old, and uh, this was in the downstairs uh, recording studio at Capitol Records where we, where we held the press conference, and we gave them their um, gold records for the Help album, album that day. I really had a lot on my plate at that time. I would, I would basically walk out of the door of my house and get on an airplane to go someplace and couldn't get back for two or three months at a time. And then when the Beatles asked me to, to uh, come over and uh, run Apple for them in America, then Capital created a new position called uh, Director of Independent Labels and we started not only taking on Apple Records but we started taking on other record labels. This is really an interesting picture. We were, we were having the Apple meetings in London and uh, the building had just been painted all white inside and out and green carpet but there was no furniture so we held our first meetings like this sitting on the floor of the Apple building. This is Ringo and I in our 50s and we put together an album for private music and this was the party celebrating the fact that he just finished his album this is in a hotel room on Hyde Park in London when we were putting together Apple Records and we rented a suite uh, barely room to move around and um, but that's how how we did it success did bring money and also as I was talking about how pure we all were about it I don't think there's one of us that wouldn't uh, deny the fact that we really like the money. I can only speak for myself and maybe sometimes I'm speaking for other people that it became such a part of your life then uh, then things start getting mixed up. Meditation was the key to uh, releasing all the uh, anxieties and frustrations so that we can reveal what we really are which is Satchitananda. Um, perfection and that's it each one is potentially divine and the goal is just to realize that it was George who actually moved me into uh, spiritual matters and because of him I started meditating and, and got a guru and um, we were uh, I'd rented a house for him in, in uh, LA and and we were in the kitchen and he was cooking up some veggies and we just got talking and, and he explained to me why he didn't eat meat and the spiritual reasons for it and that really started me on my metaphysical path and, and uh, being a, you know, a new ager. I used to spend many hours, many days, uh, weeks in seclusion doing these kind of things on different uh, meditation retreats and yoga classes and uh, chanting classes and, and uh, in teaching and being taught in meditation sitting at the foot of my guru for uh, weeks at a time. And even though I spent 10 years in the metaphysical uh, arena and teaching and, and being a favored chela of a major guru, at the end it left me empty. During the good days I was able to buy this quarter of a mile of ocean frontage, two private streams, stairs that went down to private coves, home and guest home, and I left here with three cardboard boxes and three suitcases, no money, no hopes, no work, and went to Nashville, Tennessee to start all over. I just finished a video shoot and we decided to go to a restaurant and um, we were sitting and talking and this 
men um, walked over to our table and asked if he could introduce himself. We started seeing each other and uh, as much as we felt for each other we had a real serious problem because every time we would get talking the conversation came down to the way and a way. He always would agree with me that that yes Jesus is a way and I, I said no he's the way and um, almost all of our discussions ended with that. And this went on long enough to where she finally decided that as much as we cared about each other and as much as it felt like for some odd reason we were put together that she could not be unequally yoked. Bottom line is that he had a guru and that was no. <laughs> I'd change gurus for you in a second. I mean, that's how much I care about you, but uh, anyway, I thought if Jesus means this much to her, you know, I, th I think I want some of this. My, my conversion to Christianity, I think, was the return to, I think, as I said in the book, um, drinking of the sweet well water that my mother had spoon-fed me as I was growing up. She never, ever stopped praying for my brother and I. Unwittingly, I gave her probably the most precious gift she ever had, and that was uh, accepting the Lord as my Savior. I'm happy here on the edge of the ocean with an incredible life and writing and each day I just wonder where it's going from here. Hi, I'm Ken Mansfield and I used to work with the Beatles. But you know what? A while back I got an incredible promotion because now I serve the man, okay? <laughs> I, guess <you> could <laughs> I guess you could say I went from the Fab Four to the Big Three. <laughs> I went from listening to John, Paul, George, and Ringo to reading about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, yes, this, I am the same guy in the film. You know, Honey Lake is such a special place, and, and Pastor Bob is just so classy. So I wanted to look kind of classy, too, so... I told him, I said, you know, dye my hair kind of gray and, and uh, thin out the top a little bit just so, just so that's just for you guys. Otherwise, never mind. <laughs> okay. Okay, you've seen the film. You've heard some great music. You've heard some great music. <laughs> and now I'm going to give my testimony. And we do have unlimited time today, so like Taylor Swift always tells her new boyfriends, I won't keep you too long. And then... <laughs> I became a believer very late in life. And uh, I'm going to talk about something uh, right now that I think a lot of you uh, can be very familiar with. And as a new believer, I was faced with this thing called prayer. Now, I mean, all of a sudden going from being this this wretch my whole life, and being such a jerk. And now, immediately, I can start talking to God himself. I can come before Heavenly Father. I can have conversations with him. I can make requests. I can tell him what's on my heart. You know, it just, it just was kind of odd for me. And uh, also, I'd heard that there was like, you know, a rules, how you were kind of supposed to do it. You were supposed to do this, and then, then that. And it was pretty confusing. Didn't feel I knew the terminology. But what happened? The minute I became a believer, God put on my heart that I was to begin my day reading his holy word. Now, this wasn't a works thing. This wasn't something I thought, you know, because I have been out there for quite a while, that if God sees me reading the Bible every morning, then he'll start liking me. It was nothing like that. It was just something very supernaturally put in my being. So now I'm reading the Bible in the morning, and here's these beautiful prayers in there. And I thought, wow, this stuff is like thousands of years old, but I'm reading this this morning, and it has to do exactly with what's going on in my heart. So I got an idea. I thought, you know, if I just take like one of these prayers and I just change a word, he'll never know where I got this stuff, right? And I mean, I'll lift these prayers up. To, you know, it worked for Paul and David and Moses and those guys, and, 
And so uh, I'm in, right? I mean, this is answerable stuff. I, I know that. So anyway, well, all that was was me just dragging my old worldly way of thinking into this new, beautiful, merciful, and gracious relationship. But that was 28 years ago. And I find today, every morning when I'm reading my Bible, there's always some story, some parable, some prayer, some teaching in there that has to do with what's going on with me. So what I'd like to do is I would like to open up with a prayer of blessing for each and every one of you here this morning. And I'm going to read and pray uh, from Ephesians 3, 17 to 21. And this is from the Living Bible version of the Bible. So if you'd please bow your heads. Let's enter God's prayer closet together. Today I'm praying that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within us as we learn to trust in him. And may our roots go down deep into the soil of his marvelous love, and may we be able to feel and understand just how long and how wide and how deep and how high his love really is. And I pray that we will be able to experience this love for ourselves, even though it is so great that we will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And I pray at last that we will be filled up with God himself. And all the saints said, Ole and Ina had been married for 60 years. They had probably never been more than 300 yards from each other their whole lives. They grew up on the same block, a couple of houses apart, went to kindergarten, grade school, all through uh, all their years in school, uh, got married as soon as they got out of high school. But this was 60 years later. And Ole's upstairs in bed, and it's time for him to pass on. And we're talking hours minutes. I mean, we don't know. It's going to be pretty soon when Oli leaves planet Earth. But all of a sudden, this sweet aroma comes wafting up from downstairs from the kitchen and fills Oli's nostrils. Because she, Ina, she's down in the kitchen and she's baking Oli's favorite thing in the whole wide world, sweet molasses cookies. Oli smells those cookies cooking. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Until he has at least one more of Ina's sweet molasses cookies, with the very last he has left in him on planet Earth, he crawls out of that bed, he crawls down the stairs, he crawls through the kitchen door and across that kitchen floor, and old Ole hits his hand up on just one more of Ina's sweet, bam! She hits his hand with a big old spatula, Ole, you know darn well, those are for the funeral. So. <laughs> well, the sweet smell of my success as a young man shall we say, that was wafting to the man upstairs was not quite as pleasant as Ina's sweet molasses cookies. I think you would have to say it was a little bit more like a stench in the nostrils of heaven. But I grew up in northern Idaho, Idaho in Indian reservation lands. I had purpose that I wasn't going to get out of there. I was going to come to California. I was going to make it big time. Didn't care what had been taught. Didn't care how I'd been brought up. It was going to be California. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, wine, women's song, money, cars, and homes. As we used to say in London, it was going to be the toppermost of the poppermost for Mr. Mansfield. Thank you very much. Well, how's that for a spiritual game plan to start your life with? Well, guess what? Worked for me. No matter what I did, I was always in the right place at the right time. I always had the right stuff for every situation. I mean, the doors flew open and I ran through them, gathering all the stuff on the way. Well, there herein lies the deception. You know, the Satan's, Satan is a deceiver, and he had me believe in the reason I was doing so good is because I was so smart that I could just have anything I wanted because I was such a hot shot. Nothing to do with a loving Heavenly Father who had truly blessed me with abilities and talents and gave me a knack of how to make it in a very, very tough business. Well, you know, one of the great tragedies of early success is you get so full of yourself that you don't leave any room for God in there. Okay, here's the problem. I got totally hooked and lost in the world's ways. And what I'd done as a young man is I had made success my God. Now you all know where this story is going. Because one day the success went away, the failure came my way, and I found myself alone and confused, a young man living in a godless world. Uh, I learned something when I was down there, though. You know, and I know, because by the way, you saw the, uh, the New Age thing in the film there. 
Uh, I learned how to read minds, and I can still do that. And I can just read your minds right now. You're going, oh, wait a minute. You've already told us what a hot shot you were. And if you were so smart, how could you let that happen? I can answer that with just one word, God. Nothing in my life was about him. Everything was about me and what I wanted. So I bottomed out, but I learned something down there. I found myself in such a deep, down, dank, dark, and dirty place that I learned a very important lesson. I learned when you're down to nothing, God's up to something. Now, I am going to stay on time. I do stick with my notes, and my notes, and you can't see it from there, right there, it said, when I said that, everybody yelled amen. So we're going to do it one more time. <laughs> when you're down to nothing, God's up to something. Amen. Ah, that's better. Pastor Bob's giving me this real squirrely look here. <laughs> That's called, in the business, pulling an amen. Now, I'm not going to do that anymore. I feel so at home here. I've been made so comfortable. Connie and I have just had a wonderful time. So I just feel I won't need to do that. If I say something and you want to say amen, you say amen. And if I say something you don't, don't say amen, okay? Who said amen? <laughs> I spent over 30 years in the entertainment business. I spent... Uh, five of those years as an executive at Capitol Records. And I had several positions while I was there, but one of uh, the positions I had was called National Promotion Manager. Now, what this meant was is I had like 50 guys that worked for me spread out across the United States, placed in the strategic markets, and it was their job when we released a new record is they would take the records around to the radio stations and try and get them airplay, and, and when the artists were on tour, they would take the artists around and promote their careers and promote their records, and in those days, we wore suits and ties. My field men wore suits and ties. And I had a guy in Chicago, and we all have one of these guys in the workplace. They always kind of do things just a little bit better than everybody else. And he only not wore a, uh, he not only wore a suit and a tie, he wore a fine suit and fine ties, and he wore a hat. He had a thing for hats. Hats were required, but this guy had the most incredible hat collection you ever saw. I think he had a hat for every, I think he had a hat for taking out the garbage. I don't know. This guy was just into his hats. He went out one day and bought a hat for $60. Now, you do the math. I mean, this was the late 60s. Can you imagine anything that cost $50 or $60 in those days, what that would cost today? This was a fine hat. This was his favorite hat. This is a hat he wore on special occasions, like, like when a really big name artist came to town. Well, this is one of those days, and he's got his fine hat on, and he has his artist in tow, and he's taking his artist around, and he goes around the corner of a built. I did mention he was my man in Chicago, right? The Windy City. Goes around the corner, hat blows off, his favorite hat. It's rolling in the street. He's screaming, chasing, trying to grab the hat. It goes out in the street. Car runs over it. Hat's gone. I get his expense report the next week. You're ahead of me. There it is. There's that hat, $60. Well, we didn't have a clothing allowance at Capital, and that's sorry, that was his tough luck. So I cross the hat off. I check everything else. It's good. I sign off for payment, send it in, and uh, without the hat, of course. I get his expense report the second week. There's that hat again. I cross it off again. The rest of his expense report is good. I sign off, send it in for payment again, minus the hat again. I get his expense report the third week, and... Oh, wait a minute. The hat's not on there. He got the message. I check his expense report. It's perfect. I'll just sign. He put an asterisk at the bottom of the expense report. The hat's in there somewhere, boss. You find it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a true story. <laughs> well, my circumstances, my bottoming apart, my, my bottoming out and falling apart and all that was like this hat. It was like this expense report. God was in there somewhere. I just needed to find him. And what I did is I realized that things had gone beyond me. I realized that they'd come to a point where I couldn't control things anymore. I had started to understand that there was something in my heart that needed to change. You know, when I look back at that time in my life, uh, because I know me, I know how I was put together, and I know how I used to think. I know now, if I would have maintained that level of success, I would have never turned to him. I praise God every single day of my life for the circumstances 
that drew me to him. See? Now that's better when it's natural like that, isn't it? Now, now I talked about bottoming out. I mean, if we had a three-day seminar here, there's no way I could, you know, we, we gloss over things like, okay, I, I was down here, I was up here, I was down here. We gloss over these things. If in three days I couldn't tell you all the things that happened and just how bad it got and how long, uh, just how horrible it was. I'm just going to try and give you just a teeny little example. When my life fell apart, nobody in the music business had a better resume than I did. I mean, being uh, the head of Apple Records and running the Beatles company and their personal liaison was the biggest position in the business. But uh, I'm just, uh, it just didn't make sense. Uh, Everything started falling apart. Well, well, here's what happened: is uh, I went to work at Capitol, became a director of independent labels, and then the U.S. manager of Apple Records. When the Beatles start falling apart, and then and the Apple thing started falling apart, a bunch of us left Apple, and I went to MGM and became a vice president of MGM. And then Andy Williams hired me away from there, and I became a president of a CBS label that he owned. And I'm doing so good for these corporations, I think, well, why don't you know, I set up my own corporation, make the big bucks for myself? So I uh, set up my own, my own corporation and started producing some of the biggest artists of the day. A lot of you won't remember these people, whether it is Andy Williams or Don Ho or Waylon Jennings or David Cassidy or the Flying Burrito Brothers. I mean, these were top acts in those days. And I was just on top of the world, but something started happening. Uh, I wasn't getting the hits anymore. I wasn't signing the big acts anymore. Uh, I wasn't getting the big projects. And of course, you know, the big bucks were coming in for a while, but then when the big bucks quit going, coming in, but the big bucks were still going out and the teeny bucks were coming in. So pretty soon my company starts just going under. And now I spend my time chasing my, uh, my company, just trying to keep things together. And so instead of being creative, I'm just, you know, chasing after trying to keep things from falling apart. And it eventually did. The company goes down, I go down. I mean, I lose everything. So here I am in L.A., and I thought, well, I've got this perfect resume, and I was one of the kind of people that just didn't make enemies on the way up, so it should be no problem. Uh, I'll just go back to the corporations and suck it up and, and be an executive at one of the corporations again. The doors were closed for some reason, and it made no sense. I mean, I, like... A lot of these people now that moved up to vice presidents and presidents and were running the big companies were people that I'd mentored, people that I'd hired, people that I'd you know, cared for, and got, but I, st I couldn't even get a job at those companies. So I'm in L.A., and I thought, okay, what I'm going to need to do is I'm bombing out here. I'm just going to go back to Nashville and pick up where I left off there. I was the producer to the outlaw movement with Waylon and Willie and Jesse and Tom Paul and that whole thing, and I thought, I'll just go back there and pick up where I left off. I go back to Nashville, Tennessee, and I can't get arrested. Well, I can get arrested. I mean, <laughs> I was looking for a job, you know. But I couldn't get a job in the mail rooms of the companies I used to run in, in Nashville from the West Coast. But I persevered. I finally did get a job, and I got a job in my industry. Now, this wasn't exactly the kind of job I was looking for. But they built a brand new amphitheater in Nashville called the Starwood Amphitheater. And it seated close to between 15 and 20,000 people. Kenny, you're probably familiar with that place. And uh, I got a job as a stagehand. Now, this is usually where you start out. This is like the 20 some year old guys, that, you know, kind of a job. And here I'm almost 50 years old now with all this executive experience. So here I am. Starwood Amphitheater, uh, 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, the big semis start backing up the facility. I'm in the bowels of these trucks with these young guys. And we're lifting heavy equipment. And we're flying the sound and putting up the lights. And we start with a bare concrete stage around 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, you're basically building a little, a little town, a complete infrastructure. And especially when, like, a heavy metal act comes in, man, they just, you know, you're really into some stuff when you're doing that. We were non-union. And uh, that meant if we were running late, they weren't under any obligation to give us any length of breaks. You know, so maybe uh, we would work straight through and maybe get a half an hour break now and then. Now picture this, Nashville, Tennessee, August, um, let's say it's like 93 degrees with a 92.5% humidity, you know. And after about 10 hours straight of that, you one funky dude. 
You don't look good, you don't feel good, and I promise you, you don't smell good. Now, I mentioned some acts that maybe some of you uh, aren't familiar with that I worked with, but I'm going to mention somebody that I did work with that I know you all know, and that's a gentleman named James Taylor. And uh, James and I, uh, what you probably don't know is that James was one of the first people that the Beatles signed to Apple Records. He was one of our, our first acts. So here and I, James and I were working together in, in London. I'm the flashy guy from, from L.A. with the really neat Carnaby Brothers suits and all that kind of stuff. And he's a young guy making his bones. Uh, when we left Apple, James and his producer, Peter Asher of Peter and Gordon, um, they went to Warner Brothers, and that's when I went to MGM. So now the, and Ringo moves to L.A., and we're just kind of this isolated, you know, we're just kind of this cool little group of guys, uh, the, the Beatle guys, the guys from London and all that. And, and we're hanging out together over at MGM. I've got, oh, a little band called Eric Burden and War. And, and we're hanging out in the studio with James. He's cutting little records like You've Got a Friend and Fire and Rain. I mean, we were just on top of the world. We were invincible. Well, I got to work with James a third time. He was headlining the Starwin Amphitheater. And it was my job to go up to the artist to do their sound check. I had to walk up to James Taylor, and I mean, I was sweaty, and I was grimy, and I was dirty, and I was greasy, and I'd been working all day, and, and I had to walk up to James and ask him where he wanted his amps, and, and I had like a five-foot smell radius, you know, <laughs> but, and James looked at me, and it just didn't register. I could just see the pain in his eyes, you know, as he looked at me and saw something that he never imagined would happen with me. But what had happened, this was my downtime. This is when I bottomed out. And this is the time when I came to the Lord. And what he needed to work on something on me right away, and that was a thing I had a boatload of, and that was called pride. So James Taylor was just the beginning of God starting to work on that. But I'll tell you, when he really got in my soup and moved my noodles around was the night of the Whitney Houston concert. And this is when Whitney was at her absolute peak of her stardom. And Whitney walks out, and she sings her first song, and she does not like the way her stage monitors are arranged and giving her her vocal. So she steps back. She's not going to sing one more note until they're just the way she liked them. She turns and signals for a stagehand to come out, and I happen to be the first guy behind the curtain. So she points at me and signals for me to come out on the stage. Now, I'm not about to come out in front of 15 and 20,000 people in a town where I used to be a real big deal in. And you know, so I turn around, I start to shove one of the young bucks out there. And it's like God goes, whoops, hold on there, Hoss. We're still working on that pride thing. So you get your happy buns out there because you work for me now, and you arrange those stage monitors. So I suck it up, and I walk out on that stage. And wouldn't you know, in order for me to make the monitors just the way she wanted them, I had to get down on my knees and arrange those monitors. That auditorium, or that outdoor amphitheater seated 15 to 20,000 people, but the front row started almost where this one does from the stage and worked its way back up like that. I'm on my knees, sweat's dripping, grimy, dirty, embarrassed. I look up, and I'm looking right in the eyes of all the record company presidents and famous producers that I used to be one of. And I mean, I used to sit in those seats with those people, and they're looking at me like frogs blinking in a hailstorm, you know, they're going, wow. <laughs> so here's what happened with Ken Mansfield. I looked in their eyes, and I looked up into that night sky, and I said, Lord, Father, God, this is the single most humiliating moment in my life. But Father God, I love you more than anything I ever loved. You know, Father God, you saved me out of the pits of hell, and I want what you want from me more than anything I could ever want. And Lord, Father, God, I get it. Game on. I arranged those monitors like monitors have never been arranged in the history of rock and roll. They still talk about August 14th, 1987, Nashville, Tennessee, Star One Amphitheater, the Whitney Houston concert, and the way those monitors were arranged, okay? <laughs> those monitors were arranged unto the Lord, and you can't do better than that. You know, God loved me so much that he knew I had to go broke so that I could be broken. Now here's the good news. God is the single greatest economist of all time. He will use our past, good, bad, or indifferent for his glory. It doesn't matter how ugly a sinner you've been. It doesn't matter how long you've been 
a really bad person. And now maybe you're the kind of person that's only committed one little bitty sin in your whole life, or maybe you were a little bit more like me who's had a long, wretched, smelly, insidiously nasty, awful, shameful life. Does not matter. God's promised all mistakes are forgotten. All sins are forgiven when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. God will turn to good what Satan meant for evil. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you, because I was going to hold up the sign there, but thank you. So let's look at this phenomenon called the Beatles. Can you imagine in your wildest imagination that God was unaware of these four guys down here? That he just didn't happen to notice how famous they were, how influential, how powerful, how wealthy? I mean, okay, maybe he was out that day, okay? I mean, these guys were virtually the Pied Pipers to the, uh, to the world's youth in those days. I just can't imagine that he didn't have a purpose for that. So I'm asking you right now to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say right now, because this is not as abstract or as implausible as you may think. I'm going to ask you to consider the following list of possibilities, that the whole reason for the Beatles' success and the whole reason for my success was so that I would come to their attention and that they would invite me to come to work for them. And then the whole reason for this unexplainable fall I had to the bottom was so that I would be brought to the point to accept Jesus as my Savior. And then at that point, because of my background, I had been led to write books about my experiences with famous acts like the Beatles, but also about my conversion to Christianity. And people all over bought this, my first book to read about the Beatles, but half the book was my testimony. And then through a very unusual set of circumstances, I come to Pastor Bob's attention, and I'm invited to come here today. Now all this, I'm talking about 40 years of coming off the Indian Reservation lands in Idaho and, and doing all the things I did and going to the Navy and, and, and just a series of things that where one thing could have been one minute off or a day off or a person off or something like that. But everything was like this beautiful tapestry God was weaving that's come down to this one moment. Just because all the way back then, way back and forever, he had his eyes on one person. And that person could be sitting in this room right now. Now, I know that God had a much bigger purpose for all my big dealness and all my success. And I know now that I was just a teeny part of his grand scheme. Now, you guys are looking up at me like frogs blinking in a hailstorm. So I'm going to tell you a story just to prove how God can work. Uh, we were in... Uh, in San Diego County, Southern California, speaking at this very large church. And when we do an evening event sometimes, just as an, as an event, uh, we'll set aside a 20-minute period at the end of the, of the uh, evening for the pastor, the host pastor, come up and we'll do like 20 minutes of question and answers where people could ask questions about the Beatles, about my testimony, about church, whatever. Well, we had run late that night, and because the church was so big and there was things to do with the nurseries and zoning and all that kind of stuff that uh, the people had to leave at a certain time, parking lot had to be empty, gates had to be closed and all that. So um, by the time Pastor got up to join me, uh, he only had time maybe to call on two or three people to ask questions that night. I don't know how he saw this lady because she was way back in the auditorium, but he called on her and she stood up and she said, Pastor, I don't have a question for Mr. Mansell, but I do have a comment. When I was a young girl, I used to go to this church that had the most wonderful youth ministry for girls. It was just incredible, and the wonderful thing that we enjoyed was each year we got to go on a week's retreat, just us girls. And our youth pastor would always have, a, you know, there was this great classes and teachings and functions during the day, and each evening he'd always have some special little program that he would, he would uh, do. And she said, I remember it was a Wednesday night. We sat down, and he said, here's what we're going to do tonight, girls. I'm going to pass around a hat with some names in it. And you are going to pick the name out of the hat. And before I pass around the hat, you are going to promise that you will pray for the person's salvation that you pull out of that hat. Because this hat is filled with a group of very decadent young people. And I'm asking you to pray until you know in your heart, you just know in your heart, 
that they've come to know the Lord, or you actually have empirical knowledge that this has happened. He passes around the hat, the names in the hat were the Beatles and the guys that worked with them. She said, I came with three of my girlfriends. We all picked the same name out of that hat, Ken Mansfield. Now, who's Ken Mansfield? <laughs> you know, she said, I want, to, I want to pray for Paul McCartney. That's the name. <laughs> you know, that's who I want to pull out. But she said, I committed, had no, I, no idea who this guy was. She said, I took that slip of paper and put it in my Bible. And every day I prayed for the salvation of, for, of Ken Mansfield, all through junior high school, all through high school, and even in college. She said, I got out in the world and got really busy and things kind of started happening and I didn't quite have as much time to read my Bible anymore and I wasn't praying as much, started having a really good time, started becoming successful, had no time. Pretty soon God wasn't as much interested to me. Or, well, we weren't interested in each other at that point, I don't think. And she said, I just finally totally turned my back on my Christian walk. And she said, now I was really rocking. Now it's really happening. Things were getting really decadent. And she said, about a year ago, everything fell apart. She said, I can't tell you how disastrous this year has been, how horrible it's been. It's just, she said, I can't even explain it. She said, last week, I almost, it just like this feeling like God came up to me and said, look how miserable you are. Remember how sweet it was when we were together? Remember just how the peace and the joy and the, and the great times we had? It was just like, I could just feel him pulling back. I got up this morning, opened the newspaper, and saw that a man named Ken Mansfield, who used to work with the Beatles, was giving his testimony at this church tonight. She said, that ad just jumped up at me. It's like God saying, see, I've never left you. I've always been with you. I answer prayer. So, Pastor, I've come here tonight just to tell you I'm back. Okay? Now, if you've got a better story than that, my publisher wants to talk to you. <laughs> So what's this all about this morning? It's not about the Beatles, and it's certainly not about me. This is about Jesus. It's about a loving, heavenly Father who cares about us no matter how shameful and wretched our lives have been. Even when we've gotten ourselves so far away from him, he still sees us coming way off down that road, and he's been standing there forever, just waiting to welcome us home. And he's going to say, you know, child, with just one word, one word, you've been able to wipe out decades of decadence. And that word is yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I need your forgiveness. Yes, I need your mercy. Yes, I need your grace. Yes, I need a fresh start. Yes, I believe you died for me. Yes, I need your unconditional love. Yes, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Yes, I want to spend eternity with you, Jesus. You see this awesome God? I want you to think about this. The creator of everything that ever has been or ever will be, the one true God that knows everything about each and every one of us, this wondrous, magnificent God wants to live inside of each and every teeny little one of us. He wants to heal us. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to prosper us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to grant us this unbelievable peace. It's a peace that truly does pass all understanding, and it's a peace you can't understand until you have it. Now, I'm here to tell you there's nothing out there in the world of value without him. I've been there. I've done that. I mean, think about this, especially the business. When the limos couldn't have been any longer, the hotel suites couldn't have been more luxurious, the restaurants, the food couldn't have been more exquisite. The people I was with couldn't have been more famous. The places we went to couldn't have been more exotic. But when I look back now on myself, from where I am now, instead of seeing this young hotshot that's on top of the world, I see myself as this pitiful, pathetic young man. It's like I'm looking at myself through a dark veil and this young guy scrambling, just trying to fill a haunting emptiness was stuff. You know, I did. I lived in the big estates and I ate off the gold plates with the silver spoons. But you know, I was also in the pigsties and I was eating the pods with the pigs and I was wallowing in the slime and the decadence of both the high life and the low life. And I confess to you 
this morning that I did. I squandered the inheritance of a loving Heavenly Father. And one day I realized that the lowest servant in the house of the Lord had it much better than I ever did when I was in the world. So what did I do? I asked for a fresh start. Just like that, he welcomed me home. He put his robe of forgiveness around my shoulders. He put his ring on my finger and his love in my heart. Now, I don't care how high up I got in my industry. No man has ever stood taller than I did the night I got down on my knees and asked Jesus to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I lost the world. I lost all my stuff. But I gained eternity. Yes. I have a favorite definition of eternity. Eternity, that's going to be the real long part of our existence. Now, I think it's worth thinking about where do I want to spend the long part, okay? Because this is just a moment right now. Um, I opened it with a clear, uh, prayer of blessing this morning, and uh, I'd like to close with one another prayer of blessing. So if you'd please bow your heads one more time. And let's enter God's prayer closet together. This is Psalm 90, verses 12 to 17. Lord, Father God, teach us to number our days. Help us to recognize just how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Father, come and bless us. Give us constant joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good and let us see your miracles and let our children see glorious things. Lord, Father God, I'm asking you to favor each and every person here today by giving them your kind of success so that we may have your kind of permanence in all that we may do. Now, this is where you, I'm supposed to say amen here, but I don't want to say amen yet. I'm not ready to say that. So just keep your heads bowed. Keep your eyes shut for a while. Just relax. Just go inside. Let's just be quiet and alone together because I, I have a couple things I want to say. If someone or something drew you here today, I want you to ask yourself, do you need to replace the evil years with good? Do you need some stuff covered over? Do you need gladness report to replace your former misery? Do you need a fresh start? Do you need to empty out and start all over? Do you want the hurt to go away and not be lonely anymore? Do you need mercy? Do you need grace? Would you like to be unconditionally loved? You can have that. While your heads are bowed and your eyes closed, I'm asking you to take a real good look at yourself and be honest. Have you had enough of yourself? Do you ever feel like you are down to nothing? Well, guess what? You can be up to something. You can be something special. You can be something beautiful. You can have something you've never had before. You can have something that will set you free. You can leave the old stuff behind. You can become brand new. You see, it really is simple. All you need is his love. Are you the one I came to see this morning?